look so different. The idea that we're all related seems impossible. It's hard to believe that six billion people all share the same ancestor. Yet three of the world's great religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, believe in one man who fathered us all. That makes Adam a key figure in the beliefs of more than half the world. Now, science offers a chance to find a genetic Adam, a single ancestor whose DNA survives in every man on Earth today. From the Inuit of the Arctic to the Amerindians of the Amazon, from the nomads of the desert to the businessmen of Wall Street. Spencer Wells, a geneticist with National Geographic, will lead us on a journey to identify the scientific Adam and reveal what made him so exceptional that he could father all men on Earth. But how do you unravel a chain so many generations long? A chain that leads all the way to the roots of humanity's family tree. Most of our DNA is a jumble from all our ancestors. It's what makes each of us unique. But there's a section of our genetic code that stays almost constant. The Y chromosome, the special piece of DNA that only men have. It's passed virtually unchanged from father to son, like a family name. The Y chromosome links the men of today with the men who lived in the past. This tiny piece of DNA allows us to travel back in time through humanity's history. These days, we use DNA to test whether a man is the biological father of a child. Could it really link the billions of men alive today back to one ancestor? Wells believes the answer is yes that the Y chromosome can trace the origins of men from all over the world. From Africa to America, all the branches on the tree join up in one trunk. The Y chromosome links men today back to their common ancestors. The key is to reveal super ancestors men who left their genetic imprint on huge numbers. They're like branching points where vast sections of the tree come together in a single man. Geneticists can trace them further and further back down the tree to the ultimate super ancestor, scientific Adam. Our search starts in an unlikely place. With a super ancestor who passed his DNA to millions. He left such a vast legacy, Wells thinks he can trace it in a bar in San Francisco. The Bayview Boat Club is a watering hole for a group of Mongolian immigrants. These men have an outrageous claim. They think they're descendant from the great Mongol emperor, Genghis Khan. So how many people in Mongolia really believe that they're related to Genghis Khan? Every single person in the country. Every single person. There, there are, what, 10 million people living in the It seems preposterous, as if everyone in America believed they were descended from George Washington. But if there's any truth to their claim, these men will link back to a common ancestor who lived generations ago the first step on our journey back toward Adam. So are you guys interested in finding out if uh, you could be related to Genghis Khan himself? Yeah, yeah let's go. Okay, and then uh, I'll pass... Tapping the, the power of DNA starts with a person. basic tool. They're sterile, by the way, which is kind of like a glorified toothbrush. Pull it out of the container. Looks like that. Just, Just a few it. cheek it's cells. Like and Wells can unlock secrets from our genetic past. With a simple swipe, 
Wells hopes to trace these men all the way back to a famous warrior who lived 800 years ago and thousands of miles away. Genghis Khan is one of the greatest historical figures of all time. Eight centuries ago, he ruled one of the largest empires the world has ever seen. What are the chances that a couple of guys in a San Francisco bar could be related to such an extraordinary man? Machines analyze the Mongolian's DNA, looking for traces on the Y chromosome that could link them to Genghis Khan. The odds against finding a connection seem astronomical. But Wells has some surprising news. We've got the results. He's found evidence that two of these men are related to Genghis Khan. These are your results. Saren Dorj Demberau. And Bator Tumar. All right. What makes Wells think that these men link back to Genghis Khan himself? He's never met them before. He doesn't have their family trees. And he doesn't have Genghis Khan's DNA. But Wells believes the Y chromosome can confirm the link. Most of the time, the Y chromosome is passed unchanged from father to son, like a last name. But sometimes little differences creep in like the spelling of a family name changing over time. Every so often, a harmless mutation appears on one man's Y chromosome. All his sons inherit that mutation. And all their sons. It marks all descendants like a brand. That's how Wells found that 16 million men are cousins. Their Y chromosomes all showed the same mutations. That means they're all descended from one single man, a Central Asian super ancestor. But who was he? Wells and other genetic detectives piece together the clues. The mutations cluster around one place, Mongolia. They trace to almost a thousand years ago. Scientists believe he must have been a man of power who had many sons to pass on his family line. The clues all point to one man, Genghis Khan. The evidence is circumstantial, but compelling. Khan's empire stretched from Kazakhstan to Korea. He ruled a dynasty that lasted generations. His sons and their sons had the power and position to spread his Y chromosome. As his army swept through Central Asia, they cut down their enemies, and often, it said, took their women. The result? More offspring with Genghis Khan's Y chromosome, and other men's lineages destroyed forever. Genghis Khan's DNA is buried with him in an unknown grave, but his Y chromosome mutations survive in his descendants today. The research shows the Y chromosome can take us back hundreds of years. But to find scientific Adam, we must trace a man from our very beginning who fathered not millions, but billions. As people move from place to place, they often end up far from where their lineage began. Our family tree is becoming tangled at the top. Tracing family lines is getting harder and harder. There's only one way to clear away the tangles. Analyze Y chromosomes from people who still live in the land of their forefathers. To get a clearer picture of our family tree, Wells is leading a research project with the National Geographic Society and IBM. It's called the Genographic Project. 
It's a massive undertaking. It will take years. But when he's done, Wells will be able to tell where anyone in the world comes from. Wells and his colleagues have crisscrossed the globe in search of DNA samples. From Aborigines in Australia to tribesmen in South America. They've journeyed from Central Asia to South Africa to Siberia. With the same techniques used on Genghis Khan, Wells can link this mutation to another critical common ancestor. He's known as M9. He lived around 40,000 years ago. Wells' research suggests this one man could be the forefather of half of all men alive. We're getting closer to Adam. But Wells knows there are some men who do not have the M9 mutation. To identify the common ancestor of all men, he must take us deeper down the tree. But where does he go next? There are clues from beyond the world of genetics. It's evidence you can touch. Evidence from bones. Before the powerful new tools of DNA, our picture of humanity's past came almost entirely from fossils. But that picture is incomplete. The oldest human fossils come from Africa, dating back millions of years. But ancient remains have been found at other sites far away. The Middle East has produced early human fossils. And pre-human remains have been found in Asia. Fossil evidence points to three regions that could be the birthplace of humankind. Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Can DNA resolve which one gave birth the scientific atom? Wells wants to find a place where people from all three regions intersect. A study of historical trading routes offers a likely candidate. Off the coast of Kenya, the tiny island of Pate. mysterious place with clues that seem out of place in Africa curious ruins it's the main mosque there is painted black I still see it monuments that might be Islamic tombs that look almost Chinese Even the faces suggest an intriguing mix. Some have the lighter skin tone of Europeans. Some could be Arabs. Others have eyes that look Asian. For centuries, traders have come here from all over the old world. From Europe, the Middle East, maybe even from China. Jumbo. 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 <laughs> History has created a genetic melting pot. And by taking a sample of your DNA, of your genes, we can say something about the people you're related to in the past, your ancestors. If the Y chromosomes here lead to a common ancestor for all these ethnic groups, they could lead us to Adam. If you could open your mouth. Wells takes samples from 25 local men. Great. Thank you. Okay, you could open your mouth. Where was your mother born? See you. DNA analysis proves there are men on pate from all over the place. Okay. Great, thank you. With ancestors from Africa, Europe, Arabia, India, and the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East. There is more genetic variation on this tiny island of Pate than in many countries. And the samples show something critical. They point to a new super ancestor. Even though the Y chromosomes come from all over the world, 
they almost all have something in common. A particular mutation that scientists call M168. In fact, men all over the planet share this mutation. Genghis Khan and the San Francisco Mongolians have it. Thomas Jefferson has it. Wells himself has it. Nearly three billion men share this mutation. And it means they're all descended from one man. It's a staggering thought. Genghis Khan could have fathered millions. But the man who first had this genetic mutation had billions of descendants. We're near the bottom of the tree. Could this man, M168, be Adam? There's only one problem. On the Kenyan island of Pate, Spencer Wells found one man who doesn't fit. His Y chromosome doesn't have the critical mutation. It's a crucial clue. And he's not the only one. There are others who are not descended from M168. So he can't be Adam. M168 is far down the tree, but not its base. And the Y chromosome from the odd man out on Pate gives us the final piece of our puzzle. The man's lineage originates in East or South Africa. Comparing this Y chromosome to thousands of men from all over the world reveals a critical discovery. These mutations originating in Africa appear on every Y chromosome in every man in the world today. These are the universal mutations we've been looking for. We followed the DNA trail all the way to the bottom of the tree. Every branch leads to one man, one Y chromosome. There must have been one man who gave rise to all men alive today. He is the ultimate super ancestor. He is Scientific Adam. One of his descendants was M168. He was the forefather of the ancient Middle Eastern ancestor of Thomas Jefferson. He gave rise to Genghis Khan's Y chromosome. In fact, all the Y chromosomes in the world trace back to this one African man. He is Scientific Adam. Wells believes the pattern of African Y chromosomes puts his birthplace somewhere in the Great Rift Valley region of East Africa, perhaps Tanzania or Ethiopia. He thinks this is scientific Adam's homeland, his Garden of Eden. Genetics can date the ancient Y chromosome mutations to calculate the age of scientific Adam. Wells believes he was born around 60,000 years ago. It sounds ancient, but it means our search for a common ancestor has not led us all the way back to a time of ape men, or even to primitive beings like Homo erectus. Compared to the billions of years of human evolution, we found Adam in the recent past. Critical discoveries of where and when Adam lived prove he could not have looked like this. In East Africa is a little known tribe called the Hadzabe. Spencer, Ibano. Their DNA links them almost straight back to Adam. They give us a glimpse into his world. Mutations on the Y chromosome show that scientific Adam was born around 60,000 years ago. An extraordinary time in human history, a time of crisis. Scientists believe humans were on the brink of extinction. 
The entire population may have fallen to no more than a couple of thousand. But from this moment of peril, humans begin an astonishing rise. For the first time, art appears. Tools become much more advanced. This new energy and innovation would enable our species to conquer the planet. Something critical had changed in human nature. What triggered it is a puzzle. Yet it seems to come just after Adam. As people, the Hadzabi are as modern as any of us. But as a society, they've chosen to retain the lifestyle of the earliest modern humans, the lifestyle of Adam. The Hadzabe are hunter-gatherers. Survival in this environment is an extraordinary challenge. They rely on the kind of ingenuity that Wells believes could have originated with Adam himself. It could almost be Adam's clan preparing for the hunt. The Hadzabe have figured out a way to turn local trees into lethal weaponry. The bows are strong, but flexible. Fire straightens the arrow shafts. They look simple, but when they appear, they were revolutionary. Weapons that kill at a distance deadly accurate. The Hadzabe set out, just as Adam and his sons may have done, to pit their weapons and their brains against their prey. The Hadzabe's hunting techniques work. They had to be invented, developed by someone. Someone with the insight to go beyond the techniques used by the people before. And Wells believes it may have been Adam himself who first showed this intelligence. A culture of innovation is one key to the success of our species. But what amplifies this genius is another unique skill, language. Wells believes Adam may have had a brand new ability to use complex speech. Astonishingly, the Hadzabe could show us how Adam spoke. What? 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 Tisha? Tisha? Bogo. Bogo. What? What? Simba. Simba, lion. They speak one of the most intricate languages on earth. Along with regular consonants, they use a chorus of clicks. Their speech is far more complicated than most modern languages, and that suggests it's been around for much longer. English has around 30 different sounds. Click languages can have over a hundred. <laughs> Scientists believe that when humans first began to speak, they may have used clicks like these. We could be listening to Adam himself. Bushman is the only family which has clicks. Those kinds of sounds. None of the other world's language families have these sounds. So this is really what makes Bushman, uh, Bushman languages different from all of the other world's languages. There's a reasonable hypothesis that these clicks are, in, in fact, ancestral sounds which have been lost in all of the other uh, world's languages, probably lost just once in Africa. And then the group which lost these clicks left Africa and spread throughout the entire world. In every detectable archaeological respect, meaning you know, the manufacture of art, the widespread use of materials like bone and ivory and shell, uh, the burial of the dead with, with ceremony or with ritual. In every detectable archaeological respect, after 50,000 years ago, you see this burst of creativity. There's a big difference in behavior. The form is fixed, and culture takes off. Then something happened. A small band left their African homeland on a journey into an unknown, hostile world. You are one of their children. Listen, 
I'll be honest with you. I've got a problem. I've spent nearly 10 years checking and double-checking the details of this journey until I have complete and total faith in our results. And the upshot? A story that's, well, frankly, it's impossible. If our ancestors made the journey I believe they did, they would have had to be superhumans. The speed, strength, and resilience required to conquer the world defies belief. And yet, there it is, written in our blood. But this doesn't tell me why they left. Were they driven out? Did they develop a newfound curiosity? I'm told the answer may lie 800 miles south of here, on the South African coast. Now this is a cave with a mysterious past. Long before the quantum leap, this natural shelter was a home for humans. Then they suddenly vanished. Why? I asked Royden Yates, an archaeologist from the University of Cape Town, to describe them to me. And that's a lower jaw. What's important is the presence of a chin. Mm -hmm. So this is somebody who would not be very different in appearance to any human being um, living today. Dress them in a suit, stick them in an office, couldn't tell the difference. Absolutely. Nobody would give them a second glance. You find blade-like pieces. And these would have been chipped up a core. That's a right. central Attached piece of stone. stone. That's right. Chop up a bit yeah. on the edge. And then you find over here other pieces which are, have a natural point. Mm -hmm. Now, better developed examples of, such as this could be used as a, as a tip to a, a, a block of quartz <laughs> and, a, and a hammer stone. I challenge you to true, true. produce a flake formed like that. The dating that we have shows that Middle Stone Age people were not in the shelter after 50,000 years ago. Something that, clearly happened there then. Something clearly happened there. <laughs> 50,000 years ago? Hmm, sounds familiar, doesn't it? What was it that caused these people to suddenly vanish? Richard Klein thinks it's a miracle mankind survived at all. It's extremely difficult to find archaeological sites that date between 60 and 30,000 years ago. Animal and plant populations crashed and people, human populations would follow. So it's not that there weren't people there say in southern Africa between 60 and 30,000 years ago, but there were so few of them that they have virtually no archaeological visibility. Julia Lee Thorpe, a paleoclimatologist from the University of Cape Town, explained how the drought would have caused a dramatic drop in sea levels, leaving this cave high and dry. There was a very sharp drop in temperature around 72,000 years ago. And at that point, the sea would have receded quite rapidly from the site. So the site would have changed to a different kind of place. What would these changes have been? Well, the sea was retreating uh, and eventually retreated to about 40 kilometers away. So this place would have become an inland site. And the, the set of opportunities that you see around you today with uh, enormous amount of seafood, which was obviously eaten, would not have been available. It's not possible to carry seafood 40 kilometers. What sort of evidence do we have for these climatic changes? Well, we don't really have evidence for sites underwater, or at least not direct ones. But what we do have is a great deal of evidence from, uh, for global climate changes over the long term. And we usually extract those from uh, very long ice cores in, for instance, Antarctica, and also marine cores off the coast of southern Africa and all around the world. We can extract little creatures. These are called forams, which are really very tiny. Um, they look like little grains of sand. But there's a great deal of information that's locked up in these little creatures. They're made out of calcium carbonate, and we can measure the oxygen and the carbon isotopes. And from that has been extracted a sea level curve 
for the last well, couple of hundred thousand years. And that tells us a lot about what sea levels were doing and what the ice caps at the North Pole and the South Pole were doing. Between 70 and 50,000 years ago, those ice caps were expanding. We're talking about a worldwide catastrophe brought about by monumental changes in climate. The world was in the grip of an ice age. The polar ice sheets had expanded southwards, locking up much of the world's moisture as ice. Deserts in Africa grew, and sea levels everywhere dropped, leaving caves on the South African coast high and dry. Inland, lush pastureland turned to desert, and prey became extremely scarce. Hunters who once had easy pickings now found themselves desperately searching for food. Humanity was on the verge of extinction. Miraculously, some were thrown a lifeline, that quantum leap in thinking, which meant a small band could now think the unthinkable and leave Africa forever. Where did the next human remains outside of Africa turn up? The Middle East? Europe? India? No. Australia. 50,000 years ago, the Ice Age had locked up the world's water. Sea levels were lower, making Indonesia one landmass. Australia was joined to New Guinea. Since then, rising sea levels have covered up any trace of their presence along this route. Most of the route would have been pretty easy, requiring the same beachcombing survival skills learned in Africa. But there was one final obstacle. Even at the height of the Ice Age, the coastline didn't quite reach to Australia. There were still 150 miles of open ocean. pivotal moment in our history. The quantum leap in our thinking strikes again. Modern man's ability to imagine a world beyond his horizons had taken him to the other side of the world. Although we have no direct evidence for the methods used by these coastal migrants to reach Australia, reach it they did by around 50,000 years ago. And we have a clear genetic trail leading out of Africa along the entire route. But that only accounts for around 10% of the world's population. The other 90% took a different route, and that's where we're headed next. The descendants of this second wave of explorers would become Europeans, Asians, and Native Americans. This fridge contains blood samples from populations scattered across the globe. Chinese, Russian, Native American, European, Indian, they're all represented here, and they share one thing in common. It's a marker inherited from a single man. We've discovered that this group was the second to strike out from Africa, and they took a different route to the Middle East. The Middle East, around 45,000 years ago, the bridge between Africa and the rest of the world. Makes sense. It's an obvious land route out of Africa. But why take it? The time when our ancestors left Africa was the middle of an ice age. Now, this doesn't mean there was a lot of ice in Africa. In fact, it was just a few degrees cooler in the tropics, and it was probably much more comfortable. <laughs> it's not as if they're suffering from cold. What they're suffering from is drought. What this does is to push all the animals and their predators in the Sahara out into North Africa, out into the Middle East. And from here, they were poised to launch themselves on the rest of the world. So where next? The genetic markers show that one branch from the Middle East made its way swiftly into India. This small group traveling down into India from the north 
was so successful that their numbers quickly multiplied. They soon swamped nearly all traces of the previous coastal migration. A second wave headed for China. Here, bounded by sea and mountains, they remained in isolation, developing a distinctive appearance. They were also to become the largest nation on Earth. But the genetics reveal more. It appears that East Asia was settled by two waves of migration, one going to the north and one going to the south of these mountain ranges, a bit like an ancient genetic pincher movement, still visible in the blood of the people living there today. These were massive undertakings. In the virtual blink of an eye, mankind had reached as far afield as India and China. In comparison, it's only a short hop into Europe. You'd expect humans to have settled in there, too. But they hadn't. While humans were peopling Asia, in Europe, they were nowhere to be seen. I've always had a particular interest in this part of the world. The story gets a little more personal here. Because although I'm American, my ancestors originally came from Northern Europe. But how far back can we trace that ancestry? And in particular, who were the first Europeans? The archaeology tells us that it took them nearly 10,000 years to get here from the Middle East. I've always wondered why. It turns out the answer lies underground. This is Peshmero, an enormous system of subterranean caves and tunnels in southern France, and home to a breathtaking array of priceless artwork. The artists were my own ancient ancestors, the first Europeans, also known as the Cro-Magnon people. Could these paintings be clues to their journey here? If anyone can help me work this out, it's archaeologist Michel Lorblanchet. He's made a lifelong study of these prehistoric painters. He explained that these ancient Europeans were the first cavemen with an artistic side. This is the first time that man draw in caves mm -hmm. with uh, beautiful animal drawings. This is the first time. Why do you think it begins at that time? Why? <laughs> Big question. <laughs> um, I believe that uh, at this time, uh, Cro-Magnon was uh, arriving. Uh, he was a newcomer uh, arriving uh, in this area. And he found, he discovered the cave first. And the cave became sort of a sanctuary. But if Europeans were newcomers, where had they come from? The paintings were like postcards from an ancient world of a journey. Michel explained that these picture postcards described a journey all right, a journey through the Ice Age. Mammoths, bison, wild horses, ibex, all roamed the frozen earth. But the Middle East wasn't frozen. Where had they been? Wherever they'd come from, they toughened up along the way. But I really couldn't believe what he showed me next. Bear scratches. No, the bear were spending the winter in the cave, mm. hibernating. You see, they had big clothes. Bears lived in here. These people must have been fearless. It was dangerous, yes, to to visit the cave from time to time. I think these people were just so incredibly inventive in the same way that we are today that they could, manu you know, they could manufacture what it took, new you know, make up houses, clothing, and things of this sort very quickly, very quickly, it means in a geologic eye blink. I've seen the drawing on the, on the seating. The man who traced those figures, yeah. what would his life have been like? He was a hunter. He was a this guy had the strength, speed, and wit to hunt the giant mammoths in his paintings. Michel shows me how huge this guy would have to be to reach the ceiling. You see the back of the mammoth here, the head, the trunk, the front leg, yeah, the belly, 
but the hind quarter are missing because they are too far from the rock. So he was perched on that rock and yes. stretching. Yes, and yes. it's quite a distance. That's true. Uh, in fact, this man was a very tall man. He was more than six feet high, six feet uh, tall. That's taller than the average French man today. Why? Richard Klein. Cro-Magnons arrived there with African body proportions, really adapted to much warmer conditions. When they arrived in Europe, it's interesting that their physical proportions are more sort of tropical African. They're long and kind of skinny. And that tells me that they had the cultural buffer, the clothing and the housing, that were the main thing that allowed them to adapt to very cold climates. But clothing and housing aside, anthropologist Nina Jablonski believes that Cro-Magnon had adapted in physical ways that suggested a colder, darker life. One of the greatest challenges in reconstructing the ancestry of humans is actually to put ourselves back in the time before humans started migrating all over the world. Because people living in equatorial Africa are living in a hot environment, the skin must have been able to sweat very efficiently so that people could keep cool. And also because that skin was naked and therefore was prone to damage from ultraviolet radiation. And so the skin of our ancestors was dark, full of the natural sunscreen, melanin. Sunlight produces vitamin D, vital for healthy bones. At the time my ancestors first ventured into Europe around 35,000 years ago, their skin was already getting paler in order to absorb more light. Almost certainly the first people to go into Europe were, were quite lightly pigmented. This is because Europe with latitudes in the, in the 40s to low 50s is well, a region of fairly low ultraviolet radiation throughout the year. Populations living in Europe who were not coastal populations had to have fairly deep pigmented skin in order to allow enough ultraviolet B rays into their skin to synthesize the necessary amount of vitamin D that they needed. Coastal populations were very interesting because if they had access to fish, a very vitamin D rich food source, then they could in a sense afford to be a bit darker than their hinterland brethren. But one of the things that we have to think about when we talk about the populating of Europe is that the people who went into especially some of the northern areas had certainly well, they were wearing clothes. They weren't naked. They were covered with furs or some, some kind of simply sewn clothes. And so they had less of their skin actually exposed to the sun. So that's something we have to take into account too. When you wear clothes, you have less skin exposed and the skin that is exposed has to do more work in synthesizing vitamin D. The Ice Age was to cut these first Europeans off eliminating any contact with the rest of the world. In isolation, they developed distinctive traits. Their hair color changed, the shape of their noses changed, even their height. Today, people with European ancestors, like me and these French bull players, look pretty different from our distant relatives. But why had it taken our ancestors so long to arrive here? Whatever kind of journey they made, it's clear that they developed a whole new range of life skills along the way. So why did it take my ancestors 10,000 years to get to Europe from the Middle East? And why had they changed so much? The accepted theory was that they made their way around the Mediterranean and up through Turkey. Then, our research threw a wrench in the works. Until relatively recently, we had no reason to doubt that the first Europeans had followed a direct route out of the Middle East. And then, quite by chance, we uncovered evidence that they'd come from somewhere else entirely. 
turns out, when they left the Middle East, my European ancestors went on a tough and grueling detour. I'm going to pick up their genetic trail in a faraway land that begins long after these rail tracks have run out. As the sampling of the world's populations mounted, I tackled one of the greatest genetic blind spots of the world. Since childhood, I've been fascinated by characters from along the Silk Road, traders and travelers like Marco Polo, and conquerors like Genghis Khan. I traveled to the ex-Soviet republics of Central Asia, little known parts of the world, to sample the blood of their descendants. Bishkek, the capital of the former Soviet Republic of Kyrgyzstan. I first came here in 1996, and you really had the feel that you were coming to a very remote place. You know, some of the villages that we visited in Kyrgyzstan, we were the first foreigners that they'd seen since, you know, 200, 300 years ago, perhaps. When I first came here, this was new ground, untrammeled by any other Western scientist before me. For nearly a century, it was closed off behind the Iron Curtain. Even today, it's one of the most remote parts of the world. In this isolated land, I collected the blood of over 2,000 people. That was when we discovered that their blood held a remarkable secret, an ancient marker. I recognized it immediately. Nearly every man in Western Europe was carrying it, from Norway to Spain, Ireland to Austria. So my European ancestors hadn't taken the obvious route from Africa via the Middle East. Instead, they had passed through Central Asia 40,000 years ago. That was why they had taken so long to reach my homeland. But why would they do that? How did my ancient family from the Middle East wind up here, in this wilderness? William Calvin thinks that yet again the weather played a critical role. Worldwide, you're getting droughts, you're getting forest fires, but the next year you're getting a lot of grass and a lot of grazing animals. And that's opportunity for the, the humans that survived the, the crash. And for opportunity, read food. Honing their hunting skills and adapting to the colder temperatures, these African hunters followed the grasslands into modern-day Kazakhstan. The discovery of the Central Asian marker had changed our understanding of the journey made by the first Europeans. But was Europe the only destination for these formidable Central Asian hunters? Did their journey take them anywhere else? We widened our search and were in for an even bigger surprise. The markers seemed to be everywhere we looked, from Europe, through Asia, Russia, North and South America, the list seemed to be endless. We'd uncovered an astounding secret. If Africa was the cradle of mankind, then Central Asia was its nursery. Bizarre, sea of faces. And you can tell so much from a face, or can you? Where are we now? We could be anywhere across the continent of Eurasia, but in fact, we're right at the very heart of it, in Central Asia. China is a few miles in that direction. Afghanistan, a few hundred miles to the south. This is really the crossing point, the central part of the continent of Eurasia. And I've come back for a very special reason. Hidden in the samples of those 2,000 Central Asians was one extraordinary individual. His name is Niazov, and he's directly descended from the man whose DNA, 40,000 years ago, had a tiny spelling mistake, the Central Asian marker. This genetic marker has spread throughout the Northern Hemisphere and been inherited by over a billion people. 
branches of Niazov's ancestors went on to people Europe, parts of India, Russia, and America. But Niazov's family has always stayed here. Analyzing his DNA for the first time was an extraordinary moment. In an instant, I knew we'd discovered something very important. Now we're going to meet him. After nearly 2,000 generations, Niazov still lives in Central Asia. I'm excited about meeting him again, now that I fully understand the history he holds in his blood. This is an extraordinary moment. You can make discoveries in a lab, but to put a face to a genetic marker as ancient as this, well, for me, it's truly amazing. He may be shorter than I am, but he's a genetic giant in our history. I'm going to have to give him my blood speech, though. Hope it doesn't put him off. What if I told you that your blood takes us back in history 40,000 years? Your lineage takes us back to the very first Central Asians, before Uyghurs, before Pamiris, before Tajiks, the very first people who lived here. Do, do you know what DNA is? So it's the blueprint. That, that it's your instruction book. It's how to make a, another DNA version of you. Now, the thing that we've been studying is known as the Y chromosome. And this is a small piece of DNA that doesn't really do very much except to make you male. So your Y chromosome you got from your father. Чистый. Чистый. Вот мой отец. Pure. This is a picture of his father. Вот отец. Вот который середина. А это дедушка. And a grandfather. That's great. Father and grandfather. That's fantastic. So that is a lineage, okay? Your Y chromosome came from him to him to you. Now, if, if we trace back even further, so we go from you to your father, to your grandfather, to his father, and for, so on and so on and so on, back through nearly 2,000 generations. If we do that, we reach a single man, a single man, one man. То есть, когда мы это делаем, то есть вы, допустим, один человек берем как человек. Who was living in southern Central Asia? Который живет в центре Средней Азии, то есть Евразии, Евразии, в центре континента мы живем, да? Да, Средней Азии. Сердце. Сердце. Around forty thousand years ago. Now, this was a very important man. Because, <laughs> because he is the he is the ancestor of Europeans, uh -huh. Native Americans, and many many Indians. <laughs> so, I can I can tell you with absolute certainty. That your Y chromosome, and his Y chromosome, uh -huh. and his Y chromosome, they've been here for forty thousand years. <laughs> Thank you. My crown is not chisty. That means my blood is pure. So congratulations. Very interesting blood. Я вам благодарен, что вы издалека пришли. I'm very thankful that you came from the far. Большое спасибо. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for meeting me. Я так боялся, что они меня делают. Turned out the poor guy thought a doctor was coming to tell him he had cancer. No wonder he looks relieved. Genetically, we're so close. Yet from here in Central Asia, the descendants of Niazov's ancestral grandfather ventured out to give us an incredible diversity of looks. One group traveled west along the plains of Asia to become the first Europeans. But one branch of Niazov's family reached the Americas. Their children are the Native Americans from the Inuit to the Incas. To get there, they had to embark on a journey into climatic extremes beyond anything endured before. Remember the Ice Age? Well, 20,000 years ago, it was at its most extreme. And yet, our research shows that that's when they headed straight into its bitter heart. Some of them are still there. Niazov's ancient marker shows up in a nomadic tribe deep in the Russian Arctic. They're called the Chukchi, 
and their survivors from the Great Migration to the Americas 15,000 years ago. The Chukchi aren't exactly easy to find. They live on the northeastern end of Russia. In order to get there, I've had to come to Moscow. It's the middle of winter, and this is the only place to get a flight that goes anywhere close. Finding this tribe isn't going to be easy, because they're nomads. I'm hoping the Chukchi can show me how those Central Asian hunters could survive a journey through the heart of an ice age. But this flight is only the start of my journey. We've flown east from Moscow about 5,000 miles, and this is it, the end of the line. A place called Anadir, an old Russian settlement. We're headed inland to see the Chukchi people. Don't know how we're gonna get there though. Could get quite interesting. The Chukchi live a further 400 miles north inside the Arctic Circle, where temperatures can drop to nearly 100 below. My guide hasn't arrived yet, so we're heading off without him. I've been told he'll meet us later, nearer the Chukchi camp. Here we go, the bus uptown. See you in the tundra. We're heading up into the tundra to meet the people who are the direct descendants of the people who populated the Americas 15,000 years ago, the height of an ice age. And the fact that I get to tell this incredible story and actually go on the journey that the genes have shown us it's just amazing. This place is absolutely beautiful, and it's like being on another planet. They look so pleased to see us. Or maybe it's just curiosity. I can't imagine they get many visitors. Uh-oh, I can feel another frozen handshake coming on. Time to show off a bit of my high school Russian. Spencer. Victor. They spend their lives in temperatures that are now paralyzing me. Looking around here, I'm struggling to comprehend it all. We may be brothers under the skin, but they are obviously different. Somehow, they're better able to cope with the cold. And Nina Jablonski knows why. The Chukchis are a classic example of what has been referred to in human biology as Bergman's and Allen's rules. That is, in a very cold climate, the surface area of the body will be reduced and the length of the appendages will be reduced. So the people tend to have shorter arms and legs, shorter fingers, and a shorter and rounder trunk to reduce the surface area through which heat can be lost. In that way, they're wonderful furnaces, as it were, for preserving their own body heat. Victor and his family are moving off, following their reindeer to new pastures, living proof that humans can adapt and survive in these extremes, and a lesson in just how little we really need to get by. But there's more. My genetic trail tells me that around 15,000 years ago, a tiny group of these Chukchi's ancestors survived to make an impossible leap into the new world. As temperatures fell and sea levels dropped, a new landmass called Beringia was exposed from beneath the Bering Sea. This new land connected the Russian Far East to Alaska. The reindeer headed for new pastures, the few survivors followed them, taking mankind into uncharted territory, into the new world. The sea level was, was very much lower about, you could build a 40-story building, <laughs> you know, to tell you how much the sea level had changed. 
but they couldn't go very far. They were sort of stuck in northern Alaska because of all the ice. And behind them, things weren't much better. As the Ice Age came to an end, sea levels rose again, marooning the first Americans on a tiny pocket of land. Yet they survived. An escape route appeared. The first Americans arrived here only about 13,000 years ago. And they probably walked from Alaska down a, a corridor that existed certainly by 11,000 years ago uh, along the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains. There may have still been ice to the east and the west, but there was an ice-free corridor that they could have walked down when they arrived in North America. It was essentially an empty environment from their perspective with lots of rich resources. A journey that had begun in Africa, divided in Central Asia, had now reached the last continent. For thousands of years, they had endured the most extreme conditions on Earth, and now this branch of mankind had found a new home. Our ancestors were pretty tough people. They'd survived drought, famine, and an ice age in order to get this far. Yet our genetic results tell us that the first group to make it through to the Americas had been whittled down to as few as 10 or 20 individuals. Today, their descendants are carrying, written in their DNA, evidence of those hardships thousands of years ago. But when they did get through, what was their reward? A land of plenty. They'd never had it so good. After 10,000 years of struggling through the tundra, these Arctic hunters hit the jackpot. As the ice gave way to the rolling prairies, they found a new land in which to live and prosper. Their numbers swelled, and in only 800 years, they had peopled both North and South America. I'm off to meet an ancient tribe trace their family line back to Siberia to the ancestors of the Chukchi who made that first migration into the Americas. They're the Navajo and they live here in Canyon de Che, Arizona. The Navajo Indians have been living in North America ever since their Chukchi ancestors first arrived. Canyon de Che is one of their most sacred sites. I wanted to tell them about the genetic trail that had led me to them. I also have my own sense of what that story might be using science. I'm a geneticist. And everybody around the world is very closely related to each other. Mm -hmm. We're all part of one big family. In fact, we're all related to people who lived in Africa as recently as 50,000 years ago. That's only about 2,000 generations. Mm -hmm. So you have distant relatives living all over the world who are essentially African. Mm -hmm. And you yourselves are essentially African. So am I. Can I show you some pictures of some of the people we've met? Yeah. These are people known as the San Bushmen. They live in southern Africa. And they are some of the oldest people on the planet. Africa. Are these the people that have that, 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 that clicking, clicking sound? Clicking, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, exactly. Mm -hmm. Fascinating people. Now, the evidence is that the first people who left Africa followed a coastal migration route along uh -huh. the south coast of Asia, and they ended up in Australia, the Australian Aborigines. We visited them. So you're basing this on the genetic trail. Exactly. So that was, that was the first migration out of Africa, according to the genetic results. Mm -hmm. that now the next one followed a slightly different route, one that went inland. I'm getting pretty good at this. And of course, it helps that I brought the family album along. And this man is a direct descendant of a person who lived in Central Asia about 35 to 40,000 years ago. Wow. And his ancestor is also the ancestor of most Europeans and Native Americans. Wow. He's a man called Niazov, who lives in Kazakhstan. Are you the same person that uh, did some research, I noticed on the internet, that says that the Native American people are somehow connected to yes. Central Europe? Yes, Central Asia. Central Asia. Yeah, that, that was wow. a paper that we published last year. Okay. That's good to know. What do you think of that? I, uh, I, I, you know, there's, and I was looking at a book from people from Central Asia, and I saw my cousin Emmett and Abraham, yeah. auntie, auntie, <laughs> grandma Buggy, and 
<laughs> I said, my God, I got family over there in Central Asia. These were the people Mongolian like people. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Central Asians. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's it, right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the eye, he looks like Oriental. And then he's got uh, Negro features to some extent, and also um, uh, Caucasian, kind of all mixed together. So that's interesting, very interesting. These are the Chukchi people, and they're your they're distant cousins. Siberia. They're still living in northeastern Siberia. I visited them recently. Oh, they're the ones that have with the reindeer. This. With the reindeer. Reindeer. Yeah. Uh -huh. I've seen them on TV. Their home is. They're, they're yeah, the home looks like looking. a TV. And the results show that they are your ancestors. They ultimately made that trip across the Bering Strait into the Americas. Wow. About how tall were these guys here? Um, about five eight, five, five six, eight. five eight. Yeah, about not tallest. too tall. Yeah. Uh -huh. And by looking at the genetic data we can estimate that as few as 10 or possibly 20 people were in that first group, the first wave of migration into the Americas. Yeah. My story about the journey of man came as no surprise to these Navajo. The idea of migration had been central to their own creation story since the beginning of time. The point is that somehow we're finally saying, acknowledging one another from the scientific realm and from the traditional realm, saying that, yeah, the puzzle is starting to fit together. Mm -hmm. And we complement each other. And we're all complementing each other. Our research tells me that the last stage in the greatest journey ever made could have been completed by only two or three men and a group of as few as 10 people. Just 10 extraordinary people. Once they got down there, they discovered that there were a lot of big grazing animals all over the place there too. American buffalo, mammoths, all sorts of things. And they kept spreading south and spreading south. And in about 800 years, they actually got all the way down through South America. It took our ancestors, those first humans, around 35,000 years to make the perilous journey from Africa to the New World. Today, nearly 500 generations later, their descendants can make the trip in less than a day from anywhere in the world. And every year, for about five days, nearly a million people do precisely that. They come here to Rio de Janeiro for one of the most exuberant celebrations of life anywhere in the globe. That's why I've chosen to end my journey here. impossible to tell. The scientific technology simply didn't exist. But in this era of globalization, isolated populations are being absorbed at an ever-increasing rate. It's possible that by the end of the century, the genetic signposts of our journey will have been dispersed around the globe. When this happens, the story will once again become hidden. My colleagues and I have been very lucky to be able to tell this story, to decipher the genetic clues during this brief window in history. My journey around the world has only been possible because of some unusual people. I'm African and Native American. I'm from New Zealand. My father is Welsh and my mother is Greek English. I'm from Denmark. My father's Danish and my mum's Thai. I'm from the Caribbean. My father's African and Spanish. My mother's Irish German. I'm Slovakian. That's it. No way, That's lovely. Don't do it. I will. I will be the one they choose. So, I've reached the end of my journey, and what have I learned? Well, a lot. I've been humbled by the courage and resilience shown by our ancestors, and I've, I've witnessed firsthand the powerful combination of intelligence and the human spirit. 
And reassuringly, I've proven to myself that all those years in the lab weren't wasted. The story carried in our blood really is true. But there's one lesson that stands out from all the others. It's a lesson about relationships. You and I, in fact, everyone all over the world, we're all literally African under the skin. Brothers and sisters separated by a mere 2,000 generations. Old-fashioned concepts of race are not only socially divisive, but scientifically wrong. It's only when we've fully taken this on board that we can say with any conviction that the journey our ancestors launched all those years ago is complete. Thank you.